Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. As always, it's a great pleasure to have you tuning into the show. First and foremost, I don't care where you're at, what part of the world you're at. Whether you're in Australia, whether you're in Northern California, whether you're in Southern California, whether you're in Texas or Wyoming. I just want to give a special shout out and a special thank you. And I wish I could shake your hand right now or have a drink with you because I sincerely mean that. Thank you for your support and thank you for tuning into the show. We would not be here if it wasn't for you guys. So on behalf of myself and the rest of the stories written by a current prisoner team, I want to say thank you. This is a really complicated issue to talk about, but um, um, my friend Tony, and uh, I'm going to get in this conversation as much as I can um, to talk about a little bit uh, what really did happen on the Maxon murders. Um, I really don't want to get too much into it because, like I told my friend, I'm still under appeal process. But I'll just give, like, insights of stuff that is already in the record that people may not know about or might don't realize what actually did occur or what actually the consequences of what occurred happened. I'll start here. In 1993, um, I have a homeboy by the name of Johnny Dominguez. Um, we had a peace treaty in our San Diego Valley. And in that peace treaty, no gangs would go to another gangs and kill another gang member. It was a peace treaty. And I said, if you did that, you violated that order, you're basically on the list or your neighborhood got a green light. Either way, that was the bottom line. If you did, a, if you did a shoot somebody where there was a peace treaty, that person that did that, he automatically has to be put asleep. What I mean to put asleep is he had to die. So, on um, 1993, my homeboy John Dominguez got killed on, on Maxim Street by Sandra, Sandra gang members. Now, when we brought this up to the hermano at the time, I was just a soldier. I said, hey, man, I thought it was a peace treaty. These guys from Sandra came over to my neighborhood and killed my homeboy with the top gates and let him, let him to sleep on Maxim Street, right? He goes, don't worry about it. I'll we're going to find out, and, and the guy that did it, they're going to pay for it, blah, blah, blah. And, and the hermano that told us that, his name was uh, Frankie B. from Merced. And I was running with Frankie B. from Merced when this happened. So all these years, we assumed that the guys that killed my homeboy were the ones they were dealt with, but then we found out that they were not. Now I'm going to go forward a lot of years forward. And uh, when Watershark got out, he was forcing us to do so many things for him against my neighborhood. And my homeboys finally had enough. They said, look, man, you're trying us to do this and this and this and this and that. And it says, but uh, your brother, Frankie B., when Luis Fonsan got killed, uh, my homeboy on Maxon Street, my homeboy Johnny boy, he said that he was going to handle it. So he goes, he was there, I said, Frankie told us that. So my homeboy was telling me, well, yeah, Frankie told us. He goes, okay, let me go find out what's going on. I'll let you guys know. So I'll say about two weeks later, um, Frankie talked to Weddle, where Frankie B was in Pelican Bay doing, I think it was like 16 years for, I don't know what he was in there for. And it turned out that he was right, that he told our neighborhood that the guys that killed um, my homeboy they were going to get down with. And when he found out that, yeah, he did promise it, because you know what, as long as you guys are right, I will take care of this issue. And that was the end of the conversation. Now, during that time, there was a lot of meetings that were being held at the Marriott um, uh, Hotel or Motel, high-rise place, between, uh, say, about 15, between... 15 and 17 hermanos, they sit there and have meetings about everything, everyone, everything that's going on. During those meetings, a lot of those meetings were, were being pre-recorded by the FBI, 
because there was a member inside a meeting that was working with the FBI to actually birth all the hermanos that were in the meeting. At that time, I was just a soldado. I had no reason to be in a meeting. The only people in the meeting were carnales. I was just a soldier. Well, during that meeting that a lot of people don't know is in that meeting, this hermano by the name of Water Shine, he literally states and he says in that quote, I got that in record. That's why I can say that. He says, I'm looking for, I'm looking for a silencer. There's a carnal right below me who dropped out. His name is Dio. From Monte Hayes, he dropped out back in 83. There's a lot of more courses there. I need to take this route. I need to find this because there's a lot of kids in the house. And so he's just telling the brothers that he's looking for a silencer because he needs to kill this hermano that's in the house in his apartment complex. And uh, in the house where he lives at, there's a lot of kids. Now, these conversations, like I said, are being pre-recorded. Now, everybody automatically assumes when this happened, this incident happened to Max, and that somehow, some way, I ordered this or bunch of idiotic, stupid. Now, the reason I got caught up in this is because Wettershot made me a brother. Uh, Wettershot raised his hands for me. And Wetter was making all these comments, he himself directly ordering the hits of these people. He himself telling people that he needs silencers because there's a bunch of kids and blah, blah, blah. Now, in, in April of 95, there was a, a racketeering charges brought against 12 brothers. And they all got arrested except for, I think it was three or four of them that escaped. Uh, Carlitos, Negro, Baby, um, Gabby and Gilly from Norway, um, Carlitos from Lomas, and Negro from Artisa. They escaped when the FBI is ready at the motel to arrest everybody. Now, Prior to that, this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Prior to that meeting, uh, Weddle has set up, uh, he wanted to do a meeting for San Diego Valley Oil Gangs. Now, in this, con I'm the one who was in charge to get all these gangs together. Now, Sangra and Monte Flores are mortal enemies. We don't get along with them, they don't get along with us. They kill their homeboys, we kill their homeboys, it goes back and forth. Well, I found out that Weddle had contacted another hermano by the name of Angel Martinez. His name is Andre Fasangra. And I guess from what I understood or from what I heard down the line, it was that Weddle wanted to clean up what Sangra did to my homeboy. So this part is kind of tricky, what I'm about to say, but it's going to um, it's gonna basically boil everything over. Um, the same people that killed that entire family on Maxim Road, two of the gang members that were involved in that shooting were the same gang members that killed my homeboy. They don't take no rocket scientists to figure out what I'm trying to say. Now, I met my co-defendants in the county jail. I have met my co-defendants in the bus. Um, when this thing occurred, it, it, it was... It's one of the worst things because I'm against the, the killing the child or women. I'm against that 100%. And I try to kill my own boy for being involved in killing a five-year-old little girl. So I'm 100% against it. But like I said earlier, is when this occurred, um, the orders did not come from me. There's a very recording, from, like I said earlier, from these meetings where this hermano is is recognizing that there's a carnal there and is recognizing that he needs to kill this brother and is recognizing that there's children in the house. This never came out of me. I was never present at the meeting. I was still a soldier when this was conversation was going along. And when all this... You have 60 seconds remaining. What I was talking about earlier is uh, the murders that happened on, on uh, Max and Lowe. And what I was saying earlier is that this is really a tricky, it's kind of hard for me to talk because um, if if I would have rolled over on, on 12 Carnales, and I would have been home now. But since I didn't roll over, I didn't sing like a bird, um, they wanted me to testify against uh, uh, any members, health, 
and what happened to this family, I did not want that to happen to me or my family because it would have been my fault. So I sucked it up. And through this whole time, I was still like them, you know. But between the MA, everybody knew that the orders came on me. This carnal was shot. Everybody knew this. Everybody knew, but being the fact that I refused to roll over, I got kicked to that corner. I got kicked to that because this hermano had made me a carnal. This hermano voted me in so that the district attorney, along with the Huda, they automatically said, oh, yeah, we know you are something to do this. And thank you so much. And to be very honest, no, I did not. But that's the way it is. I'm not going to get into that. That's the way it is. And when this happened, um, after this incident happened, and when I found out that who the people were, and when I found out that, wait a minute, so I, I spoke to this person, and I said, wait a minute, you told these dogs to go in that canton, and, and he goes, look, I had to make a right. You know, it's these guys killed your homeboy, so... Blah blah blah. I don't want to say that much, but you could imagine, you could, you could feel the conversation. And I know I talk a lot sometimes, but on certain subjects, I'm kind of, kind of back down a little bit because it's we're, we're not dealing with with simple people here. We're dealing with our members of of an organization that's really out there, and and it's kind of hard to talk about these subjects because. Everything has repercussions of what you do and what you don't do. And anyway, so the next day after this happened, um, this person comes to my house and tells me, Carnalito, I need you to do my part on I say, what's up? I need you to go over to Sandra. I need you to find this person, and I need you to take him out. And I said, no problem. I'll do that right now, bro. Don't trip. And when I get to Sandra, I'm trying to find this person and I didn't know at the time who this person was. So I got there. when I got there, I found out that this person was the one that killed the children in the house. By that time, I'm already pissed. Like, what's going on here, right? And then when I get there, I speak to the gang members from San I says, hey, I'm here to look for blah, blah, blah. Where is he, right? And he goes, right. I says, don't worry about that. Where is he, right? I need to talk to him right now. And they're like, hold on. They don't tell me to hold on. Where's this person at, right? And I say, if somebody wants to talk to you, and I says, please, somebody will talk to me. I don't care who wants to talk to me. Where's this person at? And he says, no, it's, it's red on the phone. I said, what? So I got the phone, and it's, they send me the money. And I said, what's up, Sean? He goes, don't worry about it. They're going to take care of it. I said, I'm not here, bro. I'll take care of it. He goes, no, no, they, their neighbor is going to take care of it. Okay, fine. In, in the subject. So when... This indictment comes down, um, the guys from Sandra turned on their homeless, and they told on their homeless that the homeless are the ones that went there and killed his entire family. On top of that, um, this gang member says, we don't know this guy speaking about me. They don't know me. We've never met this guy. We don't know who he is. And from that point on, I've seen that I was trying to get real ready because people wanted me the DA, the FBI, the, the Hudas wanted me to roll over on all kinds of people. And if I did that, they would let me go, nah, nah, so I'm cool. I'm, I'm sticking to this. I don't know nothing. I don't know what the hell you guys talking about. That's in the story, man. Right? So I get indicted December 6th. I'm the last person to get indicted. The reason I got indicted last is because there was no evidence whatsoever showing that I had nothing to do with this. But the way the cops, the district attorney were just making a case on pure hearsay, making a case on insufficient evidence to me. And and that's what really got me involved because like I said earlier, I was made mad by this in mano. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. This in mano ordered the murders of these of these people. This in mano got the same guy that killed my homeboy to do these murders, and I paid for it because this in mano, I did anything with this in mano. Whatever he wanted, I would jump. And he made me, so automatically I refused to roll over. I got caught up in this, in this 
case. It's case, but it is what it is. And there's a lot of a lot of information out there that's kind of misguided and not really uh, really told the whole story. But if people would only sit there and look at information that is from the feds uh, regarding this hermano that got arrested on right to ten charges, all the information that that information is I will show everybody clearly to see that this mano was the one that ordered the murders. It wasn't the loan, but it was this hermano. This hermano was the one who was, but like I said earlier, the way uh, law enforcement works, to be honest, I was causing a lot of problems out there in the streets for a lot of people. They wanted me gone. They wanted me out of there. They wanted me locked up. I was doing a conscious thing. So the only way that they thought that they could get me locked up and, and maybe turn was to pressure me on this case, on so many other cases that, that they were pressuring me on. I never budge. I stand still. I don't know nothing. That's how it's to it. But I got charged for the murders. I got charged for five homicides. And I got charged for the stabbing of my homeboy. I got charged for another. I got charged so many indictments. And and what I'm trying to say by all this is that um, everything that people hear sometimes is done automatically to this disassociate you or make you believe like you were the cause of this. And when you hang out with certain groups or certain people, whatever those people do, it's going to come back and bite you in the butt too. Now, like earlier, if I would have rolled over, I would have been home. But I didn't. And that's what got me in here. For me, holding my tongue, um, for me shutting the hell up and not saying nothing. The reason I'm talking a little bit about this is because this is all information that's out there. Not information that comes from morons, but information that comes from court cases. Information that's already there that clearly shows, like, wait a minute, you know, do I think I better get out? I don't know. But I'm not, you know, I don't hold nothing, but it's pretty messed up what did happen and what did occur, you know. That's the worst part about it, but... I mean, let me ask you this. As you can hear, um, Monday. So let me ask you this real quick. Go ahead. If you say that that, that Weddell Shot was the one responsible, then why isn't he being held accountable for it? Why isn't he? Why He's, why is it being overlooked? Weddell Weddell is 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 doing life in the face for racketeering charges. What I'm trying to tell you about this is that the DA, along with the FBI and the cops, um, I was doing a lot of dirt out there at CMA. And they wanted to give me on something. And they figured uh, if I rolled over, that would be good. But Weddle should have been, when I went to trial, Weddle was actually, all right now, Shadow, uh, Weddle was actually part of my case but they didn't, they did not want to indict him because he was able to be in charge for racketeering charges and all kinds of other stuff. And that's something you got to ask the district attorney's office, why not? But like I said earlier, the information is there for everybody to see in the recordings for meetings that you could actually find that through the FBI. You could actually see these recordings. You could actually hear the comments that this hermano said that. So that's a question I cannot answer you. But I do know that when I was going to trial, he was being, uh, uh, like, he was the top head of the murders. But they say that since he was in the head, that I'm the one that could get his gang members. See, but I never talked about nothing would happen. This is the first time I'm kind of talking a little bit about it. So that's my only response I could give you or anybody that, you know, wants to think otherwise. Anything else you want to ask? When you hit the when you hit the county when they arrested you and when you hit county jail, did you do your time in, in in protective custody or did you do time like right there in actual general population? No, no, no. When 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 I got arrested, um, I got arrested by a special task force, and I was sent to a, a different county because they didn't want me to have contact. With, they didn't want me to call nobody. They didn't want me to call my attorney. They didn't want me to call nobody. They came me away from everybody. And then uh, I got sent to the county jail. I got sent to high power, straight to high power. 
And when I got sent to high power, I got sent straight to an active unit, which is, there's a lot of hermanos there. So I was never in general population in this case. I had my co defendants, I think it was two of them that were actually in general population. And uh, three of them, two of them were in high power. And the rest, I don't know what the hell they were. Okay, so so what proceeded after this? So once you hit county, what proceeded after that? And and, it, and how did you eventually end up getting indicted? You know, break it down. And, no, no. and, and, I, and eventually, how did you distance yourself from from them? No, no. Um, I got indicted. I was in the streets. My first two defendants, my two first co-defendants got indicted first. And, and the reason they got indicted is because their homeboys, two of their homeboys, uh, accepted immunity against them. And they got indicted first. And then another two got indicted. The other two that got indicted, uh, they got indicted, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I would say July. If I'm not mistaken, I think July around they got indicted. I got indicted last. And the reason I got indicted last is because, like I said earlier, I was creating a chaos in there. Not in the county, but in the streets. And they were trying to basically railroad me in every which way they could by doing all these cases against me. What, what they wanted me was to actually turn and actually roll over on the enemy. And I refused that. I refused to turn over on people. I refused. So the only thing they did is they added pressure on me, thinking that if they put all this pressure on me, they put this... Uh, this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. That somewhere they put all this pressure on me that some way, some way I'll fold. And that'll work. And and that's basically it. I went to the county. My hermanos, when I got there, they all told me, alone, you should be out of here because we got the wheelers that were the same and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you shouldn't be here. And I said, yeah, it is what it is. I left it like that. Never questioned it, never said nothing because I was still active. So that goes with the territory at the time. Now, what was the other question? So, so basically, um, how did you end up dropping out of the mafia? Well, when I, when I dropped out is I got here in uh, San Quentin Death Row. I got here in '98 of um, of on Death Row '98, and the reason I dropped out is because when I got here, I saw the snakes or the demonos that were in there. You have 60 seconds remaining.